In 1995, Pixar released their very, very first full feature movie called Toy Story. And so as a result um, of our first child being born in 1995, our kids have grown up on Pixar movies. Uh, and, and it seems as though there's just been this steady stream from Pixar, but I, I am of the opinion that Toy Story is like the best of all the stories that have been told by Disney and, and Pixar. In fact, I remember that when we took our family to go see the uh, Toy Story 3, uh, my son, who again was born in 1995, said it just kind of felt like my childhood being told because Andy was going off to college and he was going off to college and it just was, it was just kind of that. Now, one of the things that uh, if, if you've seen Toy Story, uh, the very, very first one opens where there is this, this kind of secret behind the scenes world that goes on without our knowledge. Um, where toys come to life when humans are not around. And, and in the toy world, there is a specific order that takes place. And in that particular order, Woody, Sheriff Woody, is Andy's favorite toy. He's the one that if you lift up his boot and so on, at the bottom of the boot is the, the name Andy. And he's always been Andy's favorite toy. And even though that particular day that, 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 that the movie begins with is Andy's birthday party and all of the other toys are fearful of being replaced. You all remember that in that, that movie? They're all freaking out and so on. With that comes the reality that Woody is just cool. Woody is as cool as a cucumber because the reality is he has always been Andy's favorite toy. That's the perfect order of Woody's world. But there's something that happens as the, the hyped-up, sugar-infused kids go into Andy's room after they had open presents. Woody is shoved off of Andy's bed, and in his place is Buzz Lightyear, the ultra-cool, ultra-new toy. And at that point in time, the, the perfect order that was is now turned into absolute chaos. Now, I, I'm not a literature person. I'm not a person that can tell you a whole lot about plots, but I have common sense. Or at least, at least, I hope I have common sense. I probably should frame it that way. But when you watch TV, when you watch uh, a movie, you read a book, there are similar things that you can find in plot lines. And, and one of which is oftentimes the, the book or movie or TV show opens up with this idyllic sort of world. Everything is good. But within a few moments, uh, there is this, what you would call an upset of the equilibrium. It's the oops moment where chaos enters the picture. And then most of the movie or book or TV show is actually the tension that is being lived out to get to the resolution of the chaos. So last week, we actually talked about God creating the universe, and he created the universe with order. So that there was this perfect order in creation that God has created. In Genesis chapter 2, we find a little bit more about this creative order that, that God kind of brings in to be, but we're going to find out that Guess what? This perfect order doesn't stick around for very long. Let's go ahead and look at Genesis chapter 2. And if you have a, a Bible with you, uh, we encourage you to turn there. If you do not, there's, there's Bibles in the seats in front of you. And if you're kind of new to the Bible thing, I'll, I'll just tell you the page number. It's page number 2. It should be pretty easy to find and, and so on. Like I, I'm going to start with verse 8. Verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made uh, to spring every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. goes on to explain a little bit uh, in the next couple of verses about the geographical location of the Garden of Eden. And then we get to verse 15. The, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden uh, of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, 
Uh, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. At that point in time, God gives Adam another piece of instruction, part of the work that he has given him to do. It's the naming of all the animals. Now, when I think about creation, when I think about uh, this particular moment uh, in history, I want to see this. I mean, were all the animals just lined up, male and female, waiting for Adam to go, aardvark? And then go on to the next one. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, how did this happen? We know it wasn't in alphabetical order because they didn't have names yet. So was it smallest to largest? I, I, I don't know. But we know that Adam took the place of, of, of doing this. But God did this to show Adam that he was alone. And God said for the very first time in all of creation, it's not good. So it's not good for man to be alone. And so we find this right here. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the, uh, uh, upon the man, and while he slept, took one of the ribs and closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken out of the man, he made into a woman and brought her in, uh, brought her uh, to the man. Then the man said, now, I, I just got to tell you, we kind of read this, and we're just going to kind of read it along, but I'm going to read it as one of my professors said that we should be reading this here. This! This, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And, and she shall be called woman and, and because she is taken out of a man. Basically, the inflection here is Adam is saying to God, God, you got this one right. You did good right here, God. So it, the, Adam is, is rather excited here. And, and then we get into... Um, Verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now one of the things that we find here, so very, very cool, is that we find the perfect order of creation in, in what God expects us to do. In fact, Robert Lewis, who is a minister in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, has mentioned that basically Adam was given... Uh, a work to do. He was to take care of the garden. He was given a will to obey. The will to obey was, you, you've got one job, Adam. Don't eat from the tree. That's it. When you look at all the rules that we have today, all the commands that we have today, it was just one. Just don't eat from this. Eat anything else, just don't eat this. That was the will of God at that point in time. But God had also given him a, a woman to love. And if you look at verse 25, it says, and the the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. When I, when I coach couples, when I talk to people about what is the goal of marriage, uh, it is to reach that point, not just in a physical sense, but emotionally, spiritually, mentally, where we are 100% vulnerable uh, and, and open uh, with our spouses. That's, that's a beautiful picture, and that's the creative order of God. This is this idyllic world, but it doesn't stick around very long. Some people say, how long did it take Adam and Eve to, to sin? I think a nanosecond. I, I really do. I think it just happened. I, I think immediately they went over to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and went. And, and it's just, they, they were just there. Now, you can disagree with me and we can both go to heaven, but that's just where I am. And, and so notice chapter one, or, or chapter three, verse one. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field uh, that, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And, and folks, I think Satan is a master at asking that question, Did God really say? Did God really mean? And I think we can fall into that trap and be tempted in the same way where we're reading along in God's word, we're confronted with an issue, and, and we begin to ask that question, did God really say? Did God really mean? Did, did Jesus ever say? We, we, we begin to go in those, uh, those particular areas. And, and then we get to verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of, uh, of the trees, uh, fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither uh, shall you touch it, lest you die." But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows 
that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's something I think is very important. Satan does two things. Number one, he makes God out to be your enemy. He makes God out to be, you know, God knows. And he just kind of sluts it off like he doesn't want you to have any fun. Uh, God's really not in it for you. He, he starts going, kind of going that direction. But then he says that God will know that you will be like him. And if you really want to know what the root of sin is, it is our desire to be like God. To say, I want to write my own story. I want to do my own thing. I want to determine what is right. I want to determine what is wrong. I want to determine what is best for me, the direction, my story. I I want to be at the center uh, of the story. And I don't really want God telling me what to do. So as we read on, we begin to see how the story unfolds. Uh, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, read that, make me like God. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, that that's, that's something important for us to understand. I, I have, actually, when my kids were really, really little, we had those little tapes for, for them to watch uh, Bible stories and so on, and this particular one, uh, actually was the, this Adam and Eve story, and the story was as, as Eve was dramatically pulling the apple, and it's always an apple. I happen to believe it's a fruit that no longer exists, but Ad, or Eve is, is, is pulling for the apple, and Adam is running from another part of, of the garden, and he's like, no, you know, slow motion and so on like that. That's not what happened. You know what happened? Adam was right there. And the reality is, Adam said nothing. And there is a curse. In fact, I read a book called The Silence of Adam. But all throughout Scripture, times when men, men hear this, times when men need to speak up, guess what? They are silent. The reality is, there's, a, there's, a, there's something inside of men that we really blow it sometimes. Because we don't say the things that need to be said. So Adam was with her, and he watched this whole thing happen. It says in verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. It never really appeared to them, or it really kind of came to them at that point in time, that some, something was wrong here, or we're not having clothes on. So, and, and it says, And they sewed fig, uh, fig leaves together and, and made themselves loincloths. And when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I want you to notice this. There's, there's something that happens over the next couple of verses where God asks a lot of questions. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Here's the reality. God already knew where they were. But he asked the question anyway. And in verse 7 it says, he said, who told you that you were naked? Now the question, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the man said, the woman, The woman that you gave me, the woman that I told you when I saw her for the very first time, God, you did good. The woman you have given me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate it. God, it's your fault because you gave me the woman to be my wife. And then the God said to the woman, what is it, is this that you have done? And the woman said, it's not my fault. The serpent, the serpent who is in the garden, he did it, his fault. And so I I want you to see a a couple of, of things here. Why did God ask questions? I mean, if you're the all knowing God of creation, and if you are omnipresent, it means you're everywhere. If you are all-knowing, 
If, if, if you are that God, you don't need to ask questions because you already know the answers to them. So why did God ask the question? And, and I happen to believe that the answer lies in this. God wanted to show man that he has chosen his story, now small his story, the small narrative of his own life over his story, the larger narrative of God. He, he wanted man to know that what he has ultimately done in choosing to disobey God is ultimately, I'm in, a, I, I'm, I'm in charge of my own destiny. I'm the one who is in control. And so that's ultimately what happens. And so this perfect order of creation, this idyllic world, this is our bottom line here, turns into chaos as man chooses his story over God's story. That's, that's really the story of, this is God's story, but if, if you want to talk about the oops in the story, it's the fact that man chose his own story, his own direction, over the direction and story of God. Now again, I, I think we've done something. Uh, in fact, I, I'll just remember, I've gone to church all my life. I'm, I'm 45-ish years old, so I've gone to, to church a lot of times. I grew up going to Sunday school, and in Sunday school we had the flannel graph. Anybody remember the flannel graphs? And I, I said during first service, maybe that's where my love of flannel began. I don't know. But, but, but the reality is they would tell the Bible stories. We had like the, you know, the blank slate, and they would put the, the scene up, and then they would put the characters up, and you would, uh, and, and so I, I always saw that, and I remember Adam and Eve, and that's just part of it. And, and we we've, we've have children's stories, and we have all kinds of things that uh, are about Adam and Eve, and it was really easy for me to do. For me, it's really easy, and, and this, is not, this is not good grammar, so just you butcher me for the grammar. Uh, my grammar check or my spell check has already said it's not a word. We have cartoonized Adam and Eve. We, we've kind of made this into a child's story. We've made this into this, this thing that happened a long, long time ago. That was thousands of years ago. It's Adam and Eve's fault. This has nothing to do with me. I mean, there's many times I, I want to say like a kicker in football. You've got one job. Your job is to kick that football through those, those little uh, yellow poles. And I want to say to Adam, Adam, you had one job. That's it. And, and so I, I want to transfer that way off of myself. But I want to change our bottom line here a little bit. Uh, today, and if you want to write this down, go ahead and write this down. The perfect order of creation turns to chaos as I choose my story over God's. Because Adam and Eve's story is our story too. In, in fact, I'll, I'm going to say every day I choose my story. Every day I, I choose to ask the question that God really say. Every day in my life I kick the can down the road and I say it's not my fault, it's God's fault, it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault, it's my circumstances' fault. I, I, every day, I, I do that in my own story. In fact, every day I create chaos because I've chosen to put my name in light. Every day I, I choose to reject God and say it's about me and my story and my life and my direction. And some of you who know me and you hear me talking about the chaos that is in my life, you're probably going, you know what, Brandon, you're right. You have chosen your own way. You, you have chosen to reject God's plan. You have chosen the chaos in your life. And if you're doing that, you're not looking at yourself. Because reality is, every single one of us has chosen to write our own story. Every single one of us has chosen our own direction. Every single one of us has rejected the story of God, the larger story of God, for the small, minute story of ourselves. Every single one of us has done that. And that has created chaos, not just in the larger world, it's created chaos in our own lives. And, and, and here's the reality. We can blame Adam and Eve. But as far as I've read the Bible, the Bible is much like looking into the mirror. And looking into the mirror, we've got to see ourselves. We've got to see the story of us. And the story of us is very much rejection. The story of us is very much telling God, you know what, God, it's your fault. 
and I'm going to choose my own story. Now the question then becomes, what does God do with chaos? This perfect world that God had created turned to chaos because of us. What does God do? And one of the realities that happens is God pronounces a curse. He said, listen, this is what I wanted to give you, but because you've chosen your own story, this, this world that, that I created is going to be broken. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say that the, the world that we look at was, and, and see so much beauty in the, in the way that it is right now is broken. It's in its broken state. The mountains that you see, the stars that you see, it's in its broken state. Even the good things in life here today, we have in its not intended state. God wanted to give us so much more. And so what, what does God do with the chaos? You know, every story kind of got that. Starts off great and it goes to oops, kind of upsets the equilibrium. And, and the remainder of the story, most of that is kind of working out the tension until we get to a resolution. I, I've got friends, you know what they will do? They'll read the first chapter of a book. And then they'll read the last chapter of a book to see if they want to read the rest of the book. Now, I'm going to tell you, God doesn't tell us the rest of the story. God doesn't say, this is how the, the story is going to end. This is the resolution of the story. But God, he does point to the resolution of the story. In fact, in the middle of chaos, God points to a resolution. In fact, notice Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, this is what it says. Because you have done this, the Lord God had said to the servant, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and, the, and, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I, I don't know from reading from this, did, was there ever a time where the serpents had legs? I, I don't know. But I do know this. In verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and, and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Anybody seen The Passion of the Christ? No Gibson movie several years ago, 15 years ago. There's a moment in the movie. It's near the very beginning. Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is in anguish in prayer. He is basically lying on his, on his belly face down and he is praying to God. And it's dark. It's foggy. The moon is shining through the shadows of the trees and the fog and there's this bluish hue but everything else is black and lurking in the shadows is Satan lurking in the shadows is Satan with a look of satisfaction knowing that there's impending doom coming upon the Son of God and Jesus continues to pray and as he prays, the serpent slithers in to the picture. Eventually, as Jesus continues to cry out to God, the, the serpent slithers that much closer to Jesus, eventually resting its head on his wrist, which, by the way, would freak me out because I hate snakes. Soon after that, Jesus stands. As he stands, there's no fear in his face. There's no worry in his look. He looks straight over to the direction of Satan. With the head of the snake beside Jesus' foot. He looks coldly at the enemy of God. 
lifts up his foot and strikes the serpent with his heel. Now, I, I personally think that Mel Gibson took a little bit of creative license and liberty with that. But I love that he connected the curse that God set upon the serpent with the cross of Jesus Christ. And I believe what God was saying then is, listen, there's going to be a resolution. You've messed it up. You've created chaos. But I, in my own plan, on my own initiative, on my own goodness, I'm going to take care of this for you. So God points to the resolution, but he's not done. Go to verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. He gave Adam and Eve clothes. He covered their shame. But I want you to get this. In order to cover shame, something had to die. And we don't know how that's going to work out. And they probably didn't even think about it then. But because we've read the end of the book, we can look back and go, wow, God, even there, he is so prophetic. that he's saying, listen, there's going to be a time. It's something, not just something, someone, my son, will die to cover your shame. The chaos that you've created in your life, the junk that you deal with, the sin that is, is, is so pervasive in our lives, God says, I'm going to cause a death to cover all of that. We've created chaos. God offered a resolution. So what do we do with that? I think first, we're just going to have to acknowledge that we've created chaos in our life by choosing our story over God's. We, we have to come to grips with the fact that this is on us. I can blame other people. I can blame my circumstances. But ultimately, I have to own what I have to own in my own life. But also here today, I want to encourage you to, to take God up on his offer to join the cast of thousands. We talked about that last week, that we're not in the credits but we're part of this cast of thousands that God, is, God has invited you and I to be part of a story. And, and part of that is, is saying, listen, I've messed up my own. And part of that is, is, is taking God up and saying, listen, I, I, I want to be part of your story. And, and God has invited us to be participants and, and partners in the story. Here's the deal. God wants to bring resolution in our lives so that we can help other people find resolution in their lives because we get to tell God's story. And what an incredible story it is. God. His story. Where we rejected Him time and time and time again. But God, God chased us anyway. And on the cross of Christ, now we want to make things look really beautiful like this cross up here. But in this horrific, barbaric form of execution, God provided resolution for the chaos that we have created. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you for resolution. Thank you that you spoke into chaos. I pray all this in the name that is above every name, Jesus. Amen.